right side. Hi, everybody. This is our final session in the room, so thanks for being here. So as um, in the, the introduction was saying, we are going to discuss uh, the relationship between words and video games, which might look kind of strange, because uh, at first sight there uh, couldn't be anything more different than uh, games, which are usually associated to something playful, joyful, and war, which is uh, violence and uh, bloodshed, even though it might be necessary. So, the first thing I would like to ask uh, Mr. Gorka, uh, do you think, uh, um, sorry, I, our speakers have already been introduced, but anyway, uh, Dr. Gorka is uh, uh, Chair of Military Theory at uh, Marine Corps University in the US, and Santer Kivisto on uh, my left uh, is the CEO of uh, Teacher Gaming, a company uh, in Finland which remixes uh, popular games like Minecraft for educational purposes. So uh, my first question to um, Mr. Gorka, to Sebastian would be, is that game in a, an appropriate metaphor for warfare? What do you think? I think the easiest way to find out whether computer games, which I enjoy a lot, are similar to warfare. Um, let's get a couple of swords. He has one, I have one. He's the computer gamer. I teach military, so let's see who wins. I've done my 12-month service in the Finnish Defense Forces. I know, Sergeant, forces. I know, but they don't know that. <laughs> All right. um, look, computer games, I'm a guy, I love computer games. I grew up on computer games. Uh, my son loves your computer games. Um, but they're not the same. They're not the same. Because it's about life and death. When you put on a uniform and go into a battlefield, it's not about getting the highest score. It's not about finding the cheat to the next level. It's whether or not you come out of that battlefield alive. So computers are useful. Uh, in the American military, we use them to help recruit. We use simulations uh, in the army for mm. our UAV pilots, for uh, all kinds of people. But it can never replace, because it's not the same. Because Clausewitz was absolutely right. At the end of the day, it's a battle of wills. Mm. But whose wills? The will of two human beings. Not a computer processing unit and a human being, but a human being on either side. And nobody has passed the Turing test, therefore it can never substitute for warfare. I hope that uh, killing people is exciting enough to not need gamification layer on top of that. Mm. And I think that game and game design is really an, one part of the art is to build as polished and user-friendly user interfaces and user experience. And if you're looking at stealth bomber screen that looks like a video game and it may be controlled with an Xbox 360 controller, it's because it's the best user interface available and that's mm. why something like a drone pilot might be using that. But I think that you should definitely uh, separate like the gamification and game design being something that is supposed to be mm -hmm. like awarding points and all that as a word from something that you do on a battlefield. Yeah, yeah, I agree, but they are very different things. So, but uh, aren't we going witnessing something like a convergence? I mean, when I a soldier back at home in a, in a room uh, pilots a drone and kills somebody, is that kind of similar to a game? No, because somebody dies. Yeah, of course, but right. the, the perception of the person is not like he's really doing the killing, maybe? Look, I, I, I have a big problem in general, not just with believing that games are the same or a substitute. I think if you were here for my earlier discussion, I have a real issue with the over-reliance on technology. Mm -hmm. The idea that the guy sitting in the air-conditioned building in Arizona in front of a screen with a joystick uh, dropping a Hellfire missile on a jihadi convoy somewhere in Syria, that's going to win our war. Because at the end of the day, technology is neutral. Mm. It's like a hammer, okay? It's like I can buy you the very best, best mink hair painting brush, okay? $100 brush, and I give it to you. Mm. And I want you to paint me a picture like uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, thank you. Right? Could you do that if I give you the best paintbrush? With, with some practice. Maybe. He'll try. Yeah. He'll try, <laughs> right? Very brave. Mm. But it's just 
a neutral tool. Mm -hmm. It cannot replace the human being on either side. Because at the end of the day, if you want to win a war, mm -hmm. whether it's against your Russian neighbors, <laughs> okay, or whether it's against jihadis or the Third Reich in the Battle of the Bulge, what is it going to be ultimately measured by? Whether you have a man or a woman wearing boots, standing on the ground, holding a rifle, yeah? Not the guy back in Arizona watching a TV screen, but mm. whether you are controlling the environment there physically. That's the nature I'm, of war. I've heard that uh, the people that are actually doing that from a Boston office are having the most, like, uh, the, one of the most traumatized and have the big psychological issues because of doing that. Oh, yeah? that that thing, and I don't think that video games really deliver the same traumas for your yeah, mental health. That's uh, true, but they have a better <laughs> reputation sometimes in the way that they they're supposed to be inspiring violence, no? Especially shooters. Uh, yeah, I. It's uh, <laughs> it's this like history of. Uh, I think it's uh, that that conversation and that topic has been invented by old people who don't understand the media, mm. and uh, for. Sorry, anybody who's <laughs> old out there. <laughs> and for me, and I think for my generation, and for younger people, it's just, we don't care. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just uh, media that we like to entertain ourselves, we like to spend time, we like to compete in that. And everybody knows, at least in our culture, everybody knows it's, it's just a game. Although, in the game, you are virtually shooting somebody's head off. Mm. Can, can I do a little yeah, bit sure. of uh, audience participation? Great crowd, by the way. Thanks for filling the room. Um, anybody in here has uh, anybody hands up? Have you ever flown in a plane as a passenger? Okay, good. That's what I thought. How willing would you be on your next flight to get on board, put on your seatbelt, knowing that the pilot had only ever flown simulations? <laughs> Would you be comfortable? The best, sim this guy could have written them. The very best simulations. <laughs> would you be happy to put your life on the line without that person having at least an hour flying a real plane? Mm. There are actually I a lot of evidence that the simulations work really well on situations like that. Maybe, so maybe, but, maybe but the would, problem would you is you it? telling them. Would you guys them? do it? <laughs> Hands up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we've got less than 3% up there. So, uh, good start, good start. Mm, I think you're misleading the audience, huh? Uh, hey, yeah. I'm here to win. I'm here to win. <laughs> it's the American way. Anyway, you admitted before that uh, also in the, um, the military you use uh, sure. games to train. But not as a replacement, mm. as a tool to prepare. Very different. As a replacement, no way. Yeah, can you tell... Uh, it ask a little bit about this. How do you use them in a positive yeah, way? Yeah, so uh, various different ways that it's used, at least in America. Number one, because of things that are so successful as, as the product of my, uh, my fellow panelists, we use them to get young guys and girls interested in joining the military. Right? Yeah. So when we say really sexy platform, a great How game. How is that going? Do you have statistics? Is um, like America's army really recruiting people for you? They, they are using computer games mm. as part of the recruiting tool. How much it works, I think that would be very difficult to answer. Mm -hmm. you know, does somebody really know whether it's the computer game that made them join up or patriotism or something else? But definitely, a lot, a lot of money is being spent by the government mm. to use them to recruit. And then it goes to everything else. Simulation, preparation, uh, flying, drones, everything else. Yeah. But I, I think that games might be, especially in the, in the more Western and more developed world, one of the mechanics that... I don't want to go too deep in why is that, but one of the mechanics actually, you know, lowering our interest in joining in the military oh. or having wars in general. Kind of a replacement, you mean? We yeah, like, um, you, you shouldn't uh, underestimate the power of video games nowadays. For example, I don't know how many of you have heard that when Fallout 4 was uh, released, Pornhub visitors went like, <laughs> and porn is so quite that, that means we're going to have peace in the world, right? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> but uh, Santeri, would you design a video game for military purposes yourself? That's a good question. I, I, I would say that I would be definitely interested in uh, in how that would work because I haven't really. Uh, 
like simulations, they they are they are great, especially when you create the immersion around the soldier, like really driving a tank. But uh, I would say that the games or the simulations uh, where you are actually on the field wearing this laser uh, mm -hmm. vest and laser helmet and a laser pointer in your gun. Uh, those are, I would say, quite far from what we are doing, but I would say it's not, it is a simulation in terms of killing someone, but it's still like a drill where you are actually running around and taking cover. Mm -hmm. So you feel comfortable anyway, yeah, yeah. more or less. Okay, uh, as you said, the human uh, judgment in the end is always there, no? But when it comes now that we are developing robots and artificial intelligence that seems so advanced, it could almost decide by her on its own. What do you think that could be a, a danger or something? I've seen Terminator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, again, we haven't managed with the Turing test. So you know, the, the real AI that we're going to trust to fight our wars. I'm not sure we, we're ready yet. Are we comfortable? I know, you know the car that drives itself is the very trendy thing now, right? Are we prepared to have that technology fight our wars for us? Are we prepared to have our nuclear weapons in the control of a computer? I think that may be something to do with peace that we are having now. That now, if somebody shoots a one million or one billion dollar missile, and it does nothing, nobody will write in a newspaper like, one billion dollar missile lost. <laughs> or wasted. But if someone mm -hmm. dies, it's a big headline. Mm -hmm. So now that drives people to, of course, fly drones that kills people because there is no risk on somebody actually dying. But I would say that if we would be in a really, like in the hard place, God forbid, in, in war, uh, then human lives are much more cheaper to just field that rather than drones. Maybe for Vladimir Putin, uh, I, I'm not sure for most Western politicians, right? Yeah. I think after Vietnam, the price of human life has been uh, reassessed. We are very, I, I talk, uh, you know, for America, incredibly risk averse. And that's why uh, we have President Obama has used more drones uh, in the first year of his presidency. But you have peace in the United States. You, have, you get a headline when somebody moment, dies. At yeah. the moment. But remember, geography is destiny. We don't have neighbors like you have neighbors. Mm. Well, I know you, Sebastian, you're an expert in um, studying extremism and how to fight it. So what kind of role could play technology in that? Great question. So what, it, what is the role of, of cutting-edge technology in defeating groups that are responsible for things like the Brussels attack, 7-7, um, Fort Hood, 9-11? Uh, um, again, I'm very agnostic or, or even skeptical about it because we have this obsession that the next platform, the next algorithm will solve all our problems. We're just waiting for that magic algorithm. But all of these things are just channels. They're just platforms. The question is, what are we pushing through them? What's the content? Yes? If we go back to ISIS, the example that I gave, 55,000 uh, tweets or social media postings in a day. It's not, not important that they're using Facebook or Telegram to do it. The question is, what is the content of that posting? We can come up with the best way to shut down their internet service provider, but what are they going to do? They're going to set up another one in Moldova. They're going to have cutouts through Bangladesh. So it'll always be a game of catch-up. It's not the technology that will be the victorious element, it is how it is used and what is traveling on the technology, you, and that's going to come from a human. Uh, but you also mentioned that the ideology of, of yes. X thing is something that you should like shoot down. Yeah. And I think that uh, now that we have even more uh, like screens and uh, different uh, vehicles to deliver media for our kids and to our elderly folks, who knows, uh, there are more places for you to put hidden messages. And uh, especially on the game design side, and now I don't want to put like, my, my media to, to your boat in a way, mm. but I think that uh, we, are, we are the experts in creating immersion. We are create experts in you know, uh, sucking somebody in for hours and hours. And so can there be a hidden message uh, mm. that would drive to, could, could that be one of the medias that someone like 
I think you're arguing from my side. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one for the team. Or, thank you. Uh, one, one team. One team. Okay. Let, let, let me, you know, ask a rhetorical question. So when, when I was, you know, a teenager, there was no social media, yeah? There, there weren't even cell phones. Everybody in this room, myself included, a late starter, uses social media. I know that. On a civilizational scale, just be honest to yourself, right? Just, just try for a moment to step back, take a, a deep breath and count to 10. How much better is your life because of Twitter? Oh, really? Not just your life, Western civilization, the world. Let me give you one metric. A lot of people, especially on the left, I'm glad I'm on the chair on your right. <laughs> yeah, you're on the right. Um, <laughs> believe that history is the story of human progress. It's always getting better. Mm. Do you know that 2016, right now, this year, while you're sitting in this room having fun in Budapest, we have never had as many refugees in the world in human history as we have today. Never had as many refugees. We have people being sold as slaves, as mm. sex slaves, women, by ISIS in the Middle East. How has all the amazing technology we've created, which can immerse you, I agree, I can get stuck, you know, my favorite game was, you know, uh, Dead or Alive, I could play that, play that for six hours, okay? Mm. But have we actually, as a civilization, made things better globally through our technology? Are you arguing that social media is the one causing no, 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 I'm just saying blind faith that technology will always make an additive, mm. qualitative improvement. We have to be incredibly skeptical but about But I'm 100% sure that social media has, whether that's a mean of warfare or something else, that has helped like, the message to spread in, in these areas where we get this refugee crisis. But the other side of social media, let's say in everyday life in Finland, uh, Social media helps people to drive, for example, these petitions to change mm. a leg legislation or something like that. Or, and always there in the right direction, right? There are, yes, but it's at <laughs> least it's a, it's a part of democracy and it can you know, drive that for, forward. Well, Let, I, I like to give one example where, when I'm in an audience of, of military, of you know, people who actually risk their lives for us. And I know this is America-centric, but I think it speaks to the larger problem of technology. Can you guess, in the first few years after September 11th, what were the technologies that were deadliest to American soldiers and allied soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq? For the first four years, any guess what was the, the thing that was killing the most of our soldiers? Dehydration? Bombs? No? Improvised explosive devices, okay, which is basically an artillery shell with two wires coming out of it, connected to a battery and a switch, not exactly high tech, right? <laughs> and the other one was rocket propelled grenades, RPGs, which mm. is 60 year old technology that doesn't even have one chip in it, not one chip, okay? Mm -hmm. Totally anti technological. The IED, the Improvised Explosive Device, and 70-year-old technology were the deadliest things killing the soldiers of a nation that put a man on the moon, that has more military satellites than everybody else combined. So what does that tell you about technology as a panacea? or as a replacement, or the thing that will bring us victory. We have to look at the real, no matter how good that you know, virtual reality game gets, mm -hmm. we have to ask ourselves, is it really reflecting reality? Yeah, maybe one thing worth mentioning, maybe it's on your side at this time, is that uh, what you said of Twitter is also true, that uh, uh, terrorists are using Twitter in a very effective way. Yeah. So it's. Of course, it's not only a force for the good. Again, it's a, it's a neutral tool, right? It's like a gun. A gun can be used by a bad guy to rob a bank, or it can be used by a policeman to protect a woman from being raped. Mm. Same gun, same gun. It is a completely value-neutral tool. Does not by itself give us uh, automatic success. 
but maybe video game simulations could actually help in this situation to, for example, for US police to reduce the amount of firearms they need to use. For example, I remember our statistics in Finland, we don't use video, video game simulations, to be honest, but I think Finnish police shot one, one bullet during a year. Mm. Due to what? To the technology, to the video games? Uh, uh, no, in, in a real life situation. Ah, they shot okay. one bullet. Mm. But so I wouldn't, uh, from my sort of cultural background from the uh, ah. northern, northern Europe, uh, mm. I wouldn't give the example of, of protecting someone with a, with a gun. But this is a different topic though. <laughs> ah, yeah, it's a cultural much difference. bigger topic. Yeah, yeah. Much bigger. yeah we, are, we, we risk to digress, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, one aspect we didn't touch is that of um, specific of cyber warfare, no? Yes. As warfare during entering uh, the enemy computer and maybe destroying the infrastructure. This is a real danger, which is um, may, maybe not very much talked about. We have seen that happen in Georgia. And, it's, uh, a, it's talked about very much in Washington, and I think especially in Georgia mm. uh, and in Estonia, okay? Huge uh, problems. Uh, I, I have a very specific attitude to this, if, if we're interested in cyber warfare. If you look at the unclassified data for the last 20 years, uh, we don't see non-nation state actors really doing cyber warfare. So Al-Qaeda or ISIS hasn't managed to break the Bank of England or bring down the stock exchange in New York. Mm. You need nation state capacities like China. China has, you know, at least 25,000 guys that are cyber warriors. You've got to have billions of dollars. You've got to have thousands of people like Russia when they brought down the Estonian government. What we do have is terrorists use what I like to say the terrorist use of the internet. Not the same as cyber warfare. Cyber warfare is a direct attack against your infrastructure. But terrorists use the internet for what? Mm. Recruiting, propaganda, command and control. So I like to keep these things in two different baskets. Cyber warfare, nation states, bad guys like our buddy Vladimir. Internet use is by terrorists. Depends on the perspective. Mm. But yeah, uh, something that uh, may actually help uh, you to you know, uh, fight the cyber warfare or, or the other way around is that uh, something that we are building with games uh, is that when kids congregate in a space like Minecraft, for example, mm. uh, we want to make something available for that space uh, that where kids would find that useful, like something new tech. For example, quantum computers will definitely revolu revolutionize the cyber warfare mm. in many ways. I'm not an expert in that, but I'm quite sure that will happen. So now, what we have been doing is, uh, we did with Google, that there are, kids can use com uh, like quantum mechanics in Minecraft to understand them better. Because if now somebody comes to us and explains quantum mechanics, we say that's black magic, that's not real. Because it's not something we can see. Mm. Because it's something on a really small scale. But for kids, when they have been living and uh, living inside, living with quantum mechanics, it's just something that always existed. So we wanted to, when they come to the workplace, whether that's in a cyber warfare facility or not, to you know, realize the potential, understand the mechanics, and be able to work with those. Yeah, as, as for um, educating through games, no? I don't know if you're aware, the FBI has tried to do that uh, against uh, extremist behavior with a video game called uh, Don't Be a Puppet. Well, uh, who knows? Maybe we uh, can make so games that make so good games that the jihadists don't care warfaring because they have better things to do. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> no. Uh, jokes aside, the topic yeah. of serious games uh, mm. is a serious one in the sense that uh, really they can. Do you think they could really make a difference? that change our behavior for the best, not only for violence, but in general? Yeah. I, it, it's, a, it's a tough one because learning today, and I think that's, it, it, it breaks my heart to say as a, as a teacher that our current education system is uh, creating a stigma on top of learning that learning sucks. And uh, that's why everything that has a label learning in it sucks for mm. in, in, in the eyes of kids. So uh, I would say that the, the the way the media to use to, whether that's brainwash or whether that's just educate or get them excited about or curious about something, uh, is through entertainment. Entertainment. Yeah. Do you think this entertainment could be a tool for propaganda to be some, uh, one of the weapons that you could be Has using? Has it always be? I, I don't know. I, I, I have a different attitude as, as a professor, as a teacher. I have a different attitude to learning. Um, learning should be fun. I, I don't see these things as binary or dichotomous. The idea that 
you know, learning cannot be fun, well, then you're not teaching properly, yeah? So if you have a negative attitude to the word learning, you haven't had good teachers, in my mm. opinion. I, I've got a couple of my students here in the audience, and hopefully, hopefully they can verify that. But you come from the university field, right? Yes. Where usually people... I actually started getting interested in, in learning when I got to, uh, get to university because I get to study what I wanted, mm. but I hated school. And uh, I think one of the best evidences, you know, YouTubers, everybody knows you, like the YouTuber ski, uh, skin is like massive and the influence to our young people are just crazy. And they, they are saying, often you hear that it was such a nice... Uh, experience because you didn't feel like learning, but you, you know, you still learned. So I think that's a clear evidence that the word itself has a stigma. And I agree that learning should be fun, mm -hmm. but is it fun for? But it's a different topic. Not always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. You you said of course in technology is neutral, and uh, maybe it's not a silver bullet, of course. But uh, what do you think of the fact that, for instance, the, the DARPA? Mm -hmm. The Pentagon is investing heavily in uh, virtual reality for to train, or for, is that? I mean, uh, there's I think a billion dollars. I'm oh yeah, sure, so. yeah. I mean, that's that's DARPA's job. So uh, DARPA uh, is the government agency that's supposed, is mandated to look at the cutting edge technology and try and see if any of that could be brought in uh, and be of utility for national security. Uh, you know, if you w if you didn't have a DARPA. You should have a DARPA, mm -hmm. yeah? But again, it doesn't undermine the key issue. Uh, the, ne the phrase I always use is, the next widget will not save us, okay? Mm. The widget is just a thing. It's just a thing. A person has to apply it at the end of the day. And it can be applied well, it can be applied badly, and it can be applied by our enemy. So, yeah, DARPA should be doing what it's doing, but that doesn't mean that peace is going to break out because they've invested a billion dollars in AI or VR. Mm. Oh, I agree. Oh, okay. oh have we uh, won? Uh, uh, no, okay, that, good. That's, that's not, not okay. You, not, you shouldn't <laughs> agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the article you shared about that, that was all, mm. it, it didn't ex explain anything about that. It just was just abstract mm. nonsense. nonsense. So I would love to know what they're actually doing there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not that easy to find out. I'm sure. Yeah, one point that I also shared, I think, with you is what I think I found interesting, is the relationship between ethics and warfare when technology is involved. I think uh, there was an interesting example that uh, actually a war fought by robots could be, in a way, more ethical, because if we imbue these robots uh, with the use of engagement, yeah. they're supposed to be more the cold blood the than humans that maybe when they are fighting or they get uh, out of control. Right. So the, is that something to it, do you think? Or it's really always... Uh, I, I don't go... I, you know, I, I go back just to try and to make it all as realistic as possible. Um, if you are unfortunate enough to be arrested for something or to have to go to court, would you be satisfied if the judge was a computer? In many cases, that would actually work. That's a good you know, the, question. The, the it law, eliminates the human factor. If, if, if you understand how the law works, you should be very, very worried about that. Because the law isn't mathematics. Okay? The law is a guide. That's why in the British system, we have what? In the American system, we have juries. Right? You have the right to be judged by a group of your peers. Because only humans can understand the situation a human is in, when maybe they have to use violence to protect their loved ones. Mm. Maybe they have to speed in their car because they have to get to the hospital there was with their wife. was actually a guy right? just talking about criminal uh, law here. And he said specifically, and you should take ethics out of law. And so the, Good uh, luck. So the, the people there shouldn't be judging the person based on like how handsome he is or how in a bad situation he was before going to do the robbery, mm -hmm. but based on, by law, by our generally together set rules, although now it's a government, but like democratically set rules, did he break those or not? And it, I would say in many cases, let's say you stole something, 
it, there is no, not too many things to argue against that. And in that case... Really? What if you stole something to feed your baby? Yeah. Right? Well, there's the ethics right? part. Is the more. computer going to understand <laughs> what it's like to be a father who can't feed their children? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'd be comfortable. I'd like to have human beings mm. try and relate to my predicament. I broke the law, but I had a human reason to do it. But so then again, the, that careful. should come before that. You should, as a person, you should, you know, cry for help to like your community. Well, sure, absolutely. But what yeah. if nobody can help you? Yeah. And you? What um, if your children are hungry? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting point. Uh, maybe on this you are really on opposite sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, for instance, compassion or right. yeah. sympathy. I, I don't know. Empathy. Sure, uh, empathy. I'm not sure if computers yeah. could really. Yes, well, at least uh, in the American standard, the punishment and sentences you get are not really reflecting empathy. <laughs> I, I think you just did a generalization for 330 million people. Uh, Mm, well, you like sure. a very different culture. So. Not sure that's a very sound thing to do. So I talk about Finland as a group. I'm not sure that's a sound thing to do. Yeah, well, something I'm, I could be afraid, Sebastian, is that when you are uh, accusing technology or Twitter, uh, usually people that are advocating this are also in favor of some kind of censorship. So this could be kind of troubling in the sense that they are too of for communicating. So. If, they, if they do, they're in an Alice in Wonderland fantasy world. I mean, you know, if you thought you could do censorship 10 years ago, it's, it's impossible today. So I see this a lot in the military. They think they can control flows of information. When everybody's got a high-quality video camera in mm. their pocket, you're not controlling information flows. That's, again, why the human way of managing information is much more important, because censorship, sooner or later, somebody's going to get around your censorship today. Yeah, it's interesting, because we have seen a lot of dystopian novels and <laughs> science fiction films. I don't know if you've seen the film Brazil by yes. Terry Gilliam. Oh, yes. It was a mistake in the computer, and, uh, and the guy got uh, killed, I guess, because uh, his name was a bit different from the other. So maybe on, on this side, maybe it's something worth pondering. But uh, anyway... I would say on the, on the, just adding to that, maybe loosely, but uh, on the video game industry, it seems like the ethical standards, or you know, people think that all, the, all, all of us are some like, sweaty nerds on a garage doing stuff. It's not true. <laughs> uh, there are those too, but it's a marginal, like every single other group of people have marginal, marginals. Uh, but I would say the ethical standards and like, topics that we cover, there are taboos that are there, t some taboos that are... are getting, you know, broken up. But at the same time, like a lot of the topics and, you know, the he secret messages, the hidden messages you're building or we are building are quite, you know, universally accepted. So sometimes, of course, there might be like minorities that, you know, maybe like sexual minorities and the game is about that. And usually the point is to promote that as a, a normal thing that it should be like generally accepted. And, uh, and very... Rarely I've seen sort of something counter that. Mm. I didn't I, understand. I, yeah, I just like mm. from my industry, just talking for my industry here, that oh, okay. the topics that we cover and the topics that we put into our game, whether that's hidden or just uh, transparent, mm -hmm. are usually something that are quite pro humanity. Pro humanity. Yeah. And everybody, and of course, determine what that is for them. <laughs> that's, but, the question. Yeah, yeah. that's the question. Your definition of your human values, right? Mm. Mm. May not be everybody's. But any say, anyway, have you seen the, the videos of the, the robots by Boston Dynamics, uh, Atlas? That this is, uh, looks kind of scary, isn't it? I mean, the dog a robot that uh, chases uh, enemies. I know. I mean, you're the one who brought it up. The, the mm. glitch in the system, right? There's always, even the best game designers, what problems do you have? You've always got the beta systems, you've got the glitches. So do we want to have that ultimate decision, mm. life or death, in the hands of a system that isn't ultimately in the control of the human being? I just don't think we're ready. And I don't know if we'll ever be ready. Because it's, think about it, it's the ultimate question. Life or death. Life or death. It cannot be any more serious than that. Do you want that to be a hostage to a potential coding flaw? that you didn't find 
<laughs> what about the topic of software, bugs in the software? Is that uh, something that um, Sebastian uh, brought up? Uh, well, luckily, we don't have to, with the video game industry, we don't really have to deal with, deal with that. Uh, well, of course, with the bugs, but will our bugs kill people? We are not, you know, no, doing no, software for No, no, but it could be a problem stuff. for when, uh, if we trust too much in uh, this kind of tools. <sighs> well, it's hard for me to see uh, robots against humans on a battlefield uh, in, a, in a near future, in a, in a larger scale. Of course, the drone, something that is flying, that is something that is in a free space, but something that is in a, you know, in a urban environment. It seems like quite far-fetched to have like a robot that is as uh, agile, combatant as human being is mm. out there just yet. So. It's hard for me to say. Of course, uh, it would be an interesting glitch for one robot to all of a sudden turn it to the other side and start shooting the robot's own mm -hmm. group. Okay, I try to summarize. In the end, uh, we cannot trust uh, computer technology, and we cannot probably trust computer humans. So we probably have to make a decision or uh, choose a, a, an option which is in the middle. Uh, so anyway, our time is, uh, is over. I don't know if we can take questions from the I audience. Would, I mean, it's, um, when people are voting wars and video games, mm. I don't really know if that's fair, because now, what do I vote if I vote for wars? Is it like uh, the Caesar is saying now, next amusement you'll get is either video games or wars, you decide. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I agree, it's not really, <laughs> it's not really too clear, but uh, that's the topic of the battle. So, uh, if you have questions from the audience, maybe we can, uh, to our speaker, can, is there a microphone somewhere? Okay. And there's, there's one over there as well. Hello, okay. thank you for the opportunity. In the beginning of the um, uh, debate, you said that uh, life is uh, really important and valuable for government. Then uh, what is the reason uh, behind that 12% of the American homeless population is war veterans. Is what? Yeah. War veterans. 12% yeah. of the American homeless population. Homeless. So, homeless population? Uh, yeah. Don't ask me, ask the people who allow them not to get this treatment. So I don't know if you follow uh, the health procedure policies changes in the last 20 years in America. You basically cannot institutionalize somebody for their own interest unless they are actively violent to somebody else or to themselves, after 72 hours, you have to release them. This did not exist after World War II, after Korea. Uh, it is a product of the 1960s and 70s. So when you say you've got 72 hours to treat somebody, and then, you, and then it is against their civil rights to keep them against their will in an institution that can give them mental health provisions, you kick them onto the street. And that's why you get the situation in New York. I was in New York recently. It's horrific. You can't walk down Times Square without every five minutes seeing a homeless person. And if this figure is right, that 12% are veterans, that's shocking. But that's not a function of 9-11 or militarism. It actually has to do with domestic policies on health care um, adjudication. So that's, I think that's getting on to another issue. But it's as shocking to me as it clearly is to you. Yeah. I don't know if I am welcome to the United States after saying this, but I would say that it would, would have helped if the United States wouldn't have been on a, in a war for the past 80 years. For the past what? Like 80 years or 70 years. How long it has been from the Second World War starting? I guess you have only had like pretty few peace times during that. Uh, yeah, so because who's going to be fighting for democracy and for freedom? Is it going to be Russia? Is it going to be Iran? Oh, North Korea! It's probably yeah. North Korea, right? <laughs> I mean, that, that's I, a I good would, I would say from, Finland. From my, Finland from help my cultural point of view, it's uh, ruthlessness creates more ruthlessness. And uh, I don't always agree when people go to a random country and start shooting people there. Uh, as a Hungarian-American... Just who's, anyone. Who's, ...whose parents were on the wrong side of an Iron Curtain, you know I, what? I'm now referring I'm, to I'm the... I'm very Boston. grateful that America fought for the last 60 years. Because without that, there is no November 9th, 1989, and this country is still a communist country. I am very happy that America did what it did, because it has liberated people. What, whatever you think about Iraq would, and Afghanistan. Okay, okay, okay but so yeah, yeah, of course, uh, I, uh, I'm uh, like referring to everything Sunday. that happened <laughs> after the Second World yeah. War. But then, at the same time, I would love to see the separate 
uh, sort of uh, reality, what would be in a different yeah, dimension. But, uh, sorry, yeah. but I think it's something That's that we, fiction. we can yeah. discuss in the backstage. <laughs> and, uh, we are, I think we are digressing a bit. I think there was uh, somebody maybe uh, wanted to ask a question over there. Right in the back. So I have one question. So we had the MAD during the Cold War, mm -hmm. and basically mm -hmm. you said that um, people li people's lives are getting more and more valued. So we use technology instead of them, like drones. So can you imagine that it becomes at some point two drones fighting against each other? Yes, controlled by people who can actually go mad as well. So you said that it's sanity, that, that that's why we, we want to uh -huh. keep the person behind I get it. it. Yeah. So, so the question is that, that isn't it all about technology in the future and actually robots fighting for us? And that yeah, being the I, war look, of robots? I, I would... Uh, I would love it if it were so simple. If the world could be a computer game, you know, it, it would all be a land of milk and honey. Um, but why did, why did MAD work? So why did mutually assured destruction work? There's only one reason it worked. Because the people in the Kremlin didn't want to die. That's the reason. And they knew that if they press that button, America's going to press that button. It's the classical prisoner's dilemma. It's a rational actor. When you're facing an enemy that wants to die because they think they go to heaven, the whole concept of deterrence disappears. So if the other side is rational and wants to live, maybe. But if it's people who are prepared to fly a plane of 400 people into a building to win, I'm sorry, the war between drones is not going to work if it's fighting the kinds of people that massacred those young children in Bataclan in Paris. It is not a replacement. Just, it would be nice if it were. It's not going to work. Another question? Yeah. Uh, Lasso Korani, I would like to argue a little bit uh, with you, uh, Sebastian, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, technologies. Uh, usefulness for humanity, because you quoted numbers, but these are unproportional numbers. Yeah, out of seven billion, proportionally, probably there are much less slaves now than 2,000 years ago. Uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, out of uh, 70 million or 80 million people, there were like 30 million slaves. So <clears throat> proportionally, or 40 million slaves, proportionally now slaves are much less. Huh? And uh, uh, hunger was never so, uh, again, proportionally so <clears throat> low in uh, the history of humanity that people are dying from hunger. Now, never uh, was such a situation when so few people, uh -huh. which are huge numbers still, but proportionally again. And it's true also for the life expectancy. So uh, technology, uh, medicine, uh, agriculture especially, that affect lives mm -hmm. directly, I think really uh, made a big difference uh, in the last hundred years. Uh, whether Twitter makes uh, humanity happier or not, that's another question. <clears throat> but uh, you cannot argue that technology uh, has made uh, humanity into a better uh, put humanity into a better situation. Oh, but I can. Oh, but I can. Couple of things. Uh, yes, proportionally, sure, I buy that. Uh, who cares? I don't care. If you've got millions of more people in slavery, that's an indictment of modern society. I don't care whether it's proportional or not. It's an indictment. No refugees as much as we have today. Shocking. Secondly, yeah, technology makes us live longer and makes, you know, our uh, tomatoes big. Yeah, I get it. Who cares? I'm not thinking like a materialist. I'm not thinking like a Marxist. I'm talking about the meaning of life, the value and meaning of life. OK, you live to 105. What if your life is empty? Yeah? Who cares if you live to 105? I'm talking about the value of civilization. What is the purpose for your existence? Just to live another day? Then you should probably become a subscriber to that thing in California where they cut your head off and freeze it just in case they can bring you back to life in 100 years, OK? I'm not a subscriber. <laughs> but maybe technology brings us also some content to our lives. And although technology gives us a channel for some also nasty people to connect 
less nasty people and maybe ex extreme them. But at the same time, I think that in terms of whether that's democracy, entertainment, whatever, the positive outcomes, especially the connect connectivity that we have, far more outweigh the negative ones. Yeah, and that's uh, the best countermeasure also yeah. for... Yeah, and, I think it and, depends and, on yeah. what you mean by technology, you know? I right. think there will be right. a bit of confusion about that. Hmm. I mean, maybe the problem is that uh, the pace of technologi technological advancement is much uh, faster than our culture, um, our ability to cope with it. Mm. So maybe these are the real challenge, in my opinion, for the next uh, years. Again, I go back to the same issue, how you use the technology. Mm. And was, it, how like, use it. was it better 500 years ago? Sorry? Sorry? Was it better 500 years ago, content-wise? Was it better? Depends where you were living. Right? You, uh, I, I look at your blogs really briefly, and uh, I think that you have an interesting way of using media, and you had this clickbait headline of uh, Europe in its deathbed because of the terrorist attacks. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that Europe is at its deathbed because of the terrorist attacks if we act the same way as return, and as long as we are European in trying to you know, keep our heads together and you know, peace and love or whatever, as, then I think that we are far from our Yeah, and I'm not sure that worked in 1939. So, you but know, it works today. you're getting into politics again. Yeah. yeah well, let's talk about technology. <laughs> yeah. But if I, it, it started from, you know, you creating a clickbait up and, uh, and you use technology. So I do. <laughs> I do. But I use it well for the right purposes. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. So I think our time is over. Uh, thanks for staying here with us. Then maybe there will be a final vote, I guess. But... Yeah. Vote? No. I think both of you agreed with me so much, it's a foregone yeah, conclusion. Yeah, too, too much. Yeah. We should Maybe. have done the politics part, you know. Vote? That would have been fun. <laughs> no vote? I'm sure. Thank you, guys. Okay, really thank you. Really enjoyed thank it. You. Bye. Bye. <laughs> no vote?